Okay, I'll admit it. The internet had me prepared for a seriously dark and twisted analog horror series when it came to angel hair. Do a quick search on YouTube and it seems like many people have the same mindset, calling the series a cartoon that kills, cursed, and tragic. But if the algorithm was gracious to you, you might have stumbled across the video essay by Tokyo Dirty, and his perspective was really what convinced me to watch Angel Hair. Well, that and the overwhelming vote for the series on our community poll. I highly suggest watching his essay, but specifically Tokyo Dirty talks about how this haunted children's show is a piece of art and is actually hopeful and well-meaning. In every episode of Angel Hair, you'll also find comments from viewers calling the show comforting, with many wishing they had their own personal Angel Gabby when they were children. So which is it? Is it the darkest analog horror series of its time, or has Angel Hair transcended horror, becoming something unique that fans appreciate in a whole new way? Rachel Mangan said it best when she stated that horror is a vast genre and this series is more subtle in its scare factor, but it's unique and suited to the creators. And at the end of the day, creating something you enjoy is the best way to create something authentic and original. This series is definitely that, and because there's so much information and lore, this video is intended for those who have already watched Angel Hair. So if you haven't done so yet, I highly suggest you do before continuing on. Special thanks to Cody and Sam for helping me with this video. This is your spoiler warning, and as always, the video is timestamped so you can skip around to whatever interests you the most. Now, let's get started. Created by the founders of Eastpatch sisters Rachel and Hannah Mangan, Angel Hair consists of two seasons of YouTube videos with extra content that contributes to the lore, like introductory videos, music compilations, a visual novel, TikTok videos, and hidden gems throughout YouTube, other websites, and the series itself. If you're familiar with the series, and I hope you are, you know the story centers around a man named Jonah who's missing many of his childhood memories. He finds a VHS tape in a thrift store of a Christian children's animated series called Angel Hair and is flooded with comfort and memories of the show. However, he realizes that the VHS tape isn't quite the same as the show he remembered watching on TV as a child. The YouTube series is Jonah sharing his recorded copies of Angel Hair and comparing them with the VHS tapes, showing the viewers a sentient angel Gabby, or Gabriel, who will do anything to protect him from an abusive family member. At one point, Gabby comments that the book Jonah is holding is great and just like Babe in his favorite story, Jonah too can grow up to be who or whatever his heart desires. While this story teaches children about friendship and perseverance, if you think about it from Jonah's perspective, it's also about overcoming death by changing destiny itself. Babe the pig is up for slaughter, the farmer wanting to kill him for Christmas dinner. But Babe befriends the farmer's sheepdog just as Jonah befriends Gabby. Babe learns from the dog and becomes a pig who herds sheep, saving himself from death in the process. Jonah learns from Gabby how to be strong, how to hide dangerous things, and maybe how to prevent an early death by someone else's hands. Then there's the names of our main characters. Angel Gabriel is an archangel in Christianity, but considered Sarim in Judaism, a term which means princes to show status as chief celestial angels. Gabriel is considered a messenger of God, the herald of visions, and a warrior angel of vengeance, among other things. Sounds a lot like our angel Gabby, doesn't it? Zaxigail is known as the angel of wisdom, the prince of the Torah who speaks 70 languages, the angel of the burning bush who gave advice to Moses, advised and taught him. Zaxigail was also one of three angels who escorted Moses' soul to heaven during his death. Gabriel and the angel Michael were the other two. Gabby calls Angel Zag, Zagzagil, and K6, confirming he's the Archangel of Mention. Then there's Jonah. There's an entire book in the Bible devoted to a man with the same name. And for those who aren't familiar, Biblical Jonah was a Hebrew prophet who was sent by God to the city of Nineveh to prophesy its destruction due to the inhabitants' wickedness. Jonah instead tries to flee from God's command and boards a boat going in the opposite direction, but is then thrown overboard and swallowed by a huge fish and remains in the animal's belly for three days and nights until he asks God for forgiveness. After being rescued, Jonah completes his mission, doing as he was told. The reason why Jonah refused to go to Nineveh, however, was because he was angry at the city's people, considering them enemies and truly wicked. He wanted them to face judgment, to fail to repent so that they would be destroyed. 
In tape four, when Jonah gives an answer to Gabby, she says that she was thinking the same thing and that she'll help however she can. Like the biblical man, was young Jonah also filled with anger and hatred over his enemy, seeking their destruction? So by names alone, we have an angel of vengeance, an angel of wisdom, and a child filled with anger and hurt from being betrayed by someone that's supposed to love him. Eulalia Whitman, Jonah's mother, has a name that's pretty similar to Saint Eulalia. This saint was subjected to 13 tortures due to protesting the judge of Merida for forcing Christians to worship false gods. Supposedly, during her final moments as she died of asphyxiation, a dove flew forth from her neck. But does Eulalia Whitman truly symbolize Saint Eulalia, the young girl who suffered so much to protect the people's rights? There's even a Saint Francis who, among other things, would recite a prayer asking God to enlighten the darkness of his heart and to give him true faith, certain hope, and perfect charity, sense, and knowledge. Qualities that both Gabby and Zag offer Francis throughout the series in their lessons. Other sources provide further instances of times when Saint Francis struggled with the evil within his own heart, much like friend Francis and Angel Hair. Then there's a particular story of the saint being abused by his father after he stole some of his father's wares and sold them to support the crumbling church of San Damiano. And while we can make the comparison to Jonah's abuse by a family member, this instance could also represent a time when Francis was at his lowest of lows and needed the aid of an angel. In the second tape, Jonah tries to learn more about the show itself. We know that KP Publishing or Keith Publishing is owned by Giles Keith and is a distribution company that repackaged old kids shows but went bankrupt in the late 90s. The original publisher for the Angel Hair series, however, was The Wreath of Life. This company is completely mysterious, not appearing anywhere online or in business records. Then there's the original creators of Wild Hair, the show that Angel Zag originates from. When Jonah first plays the film, the words Wreath of F is displayed on the opening screen and the beginning of the last lead's bonus case shows this as well. Detective Zag wears a dove pendant on his jacket similar to the one in Gabby's series above the Wreath of Life logo, which leads me to wonder if WOF was the original name of the Wreath of Life or perhaps a sister company. With wild hair and angel hair being so different with aesthetics and mood, I could see the company rebranding or forming a sister company to create different content. I also considered the books of life and death, wondering if the F could stand for fate or finality to symbolize death, but there are many possibilities out there. In Jonah's TikTok videos, you can see him reviewing the culmination of what appears to be both his and his mother's information about angel hair, and one of the sticky notes mentions WOF and interest in obtaining employee records. His mother might have considered whether employees at the company could be scientists, philosophers, or linguists believing angel hair to be an experiment instead of accepting that something supernatural and unexplainable was happening to her son. Then there's another note. It reads, GK didn't know anything. He's a sleazebag publisher. Miss P shared her story. I need to look at WOF. The rest of the note is obscured. But we know that GK is Giles Keith and Miss P is more than likely Marguerite Padilly the daughter of late but famed author Julia Padilly, who wrote the Westpatch novels in the Ming and Sisters original animated series, Westpatch. At the time of this recording, the three available episodes have since been unlisted, but in the Westpatch series, the Padilly family sold the rights of the Westpatch novels to Keith Publishing to produce an animated series. But the wording of this headline, combined with Eulalia's comment about Giles being a sleazebag, feels like the transaction was either forced by Keith's hand or he tricked the Padilly family in some way. Then there's the most sinister presence of the series, which is undoubtedly the man known only as him. While some theorists have suggested the mysterious him could be an older brother, boyfriend, or uncle based on this image drawn by Jonah, it seems that this person could have been Jonah's father. Throughout tape two, Gabby gives advice and warnings on how best Jonah can remain safe from him, stating the sun is warm sometimes, but you shouldn't forget the moments when it burns you. This metaphor immediately conjures images of a father who can appear loving or caring at times, but ultimately resorts to violence or worse to hurt Jonah. Gabby tells Jonah, you will need strength to be resilient during times of comfort and fortitude, to be brave during times of heat, again referencing the need for Jonah to be mindful of the false comfort provided by his father, the courage when the abuse begins again. When she says, I can show you how to be stronger even though you're so small, 
we know that Jonah's abuser is larger, which could imply any older family member. But then there's the comment made by adult Jonah in the festival release of Angel Hair. He's speaking to his mother about the contents of the attic and apologizes, stating that she was just a single mom trying to protect her kid. With Jonah's memories assumably wiped by Gabby, it seems his mother destroyed any evidence of his father's presence in their lives prior to the fateful day Gabby intervened. And it's possible that his mother also suffered the father's wrath. If it were an uncle or older brother, it would be more likely that Eulalia wasn't aware of the abuse. And while I could see her removing evidence of an uncle, I imagine it would be next to impossible to destroy photos and mementos of either child. Again, like the WOF company, there's room to interpret who exactly he is. I also expect we'll learn a lot more about Giles Keith as new content comes from the East Patch team in the future. Another fun piece of lore is found in the bonus episodes in which Francis and Francine are reading letters that are actually comments from viewers who are watching the YouTube series. Both Stephanie Varens and Vanayman, the voices of Gabby and Francis, are quoted as well. Through the first bonus tape, we learn that other angel hairs exist and that Gabby is Francis's only friend. He shows us a picture of Gabby, Zagzagil, and their third angel friend, which many people have speculated is the Archangel Michael. Again, because of the story of these three angels accompanying God at Moses' death. The angel Michael is considered a spiritual warrior and is considered to be the most powerful of archangels, labeled as a great prince who protects people. But within the Bible is also mention of Michael's importance to the end of times, stating Michael will arise and a time of trouble will begin. He isn't a main character with a speaking role in the Angel Hair series, but maybe he's playing a larger role behind the scenes. Could he be the creator of Wraith or a member of Keith Publishing, using cartoons to combat evil with angels he's placed in certain shows? And if so, could his quest lead to the biblical tribulation? The bonus tape also reveals the existence of demon hairs and Francis states that sometimes they look like an opportunity or a feeling. They're not always hairs with horns. I wonder if Giles Keith has experienced a demon or two of his own. We can speculate that Francis has, as he shows a drawing of himself as a realistic badger, calling to Angel Gabby for help. She then uses a powerful sonic screech of some kind to save him, or perhaps give him his cartoon appearance and prophetic powers. In the visual novel, Francis wants you to hit demon hairs with a hammer and claims they're subtle and hard to spot sometimes. When no demons appear, Francis cheats, giving you the hot air balloon ticket, even though you didn't complete his game. When Gabby confronts him about this, Francis apologizes, saying he was scared because he knows he has inner demons and he didn't want to get whacked with the hammer due to his inner struggles. He then instructs Jonah to click on the mallet and hit any demon hair he sees, but only he and Gabby are in the scene. Gabby punishes him accordingly and he promises that he'll never run from his demons again, though Gabby seems like she's heard this promise a few times before. Then there's the Easter special when Francis paints Easter eggs with pagan and potentially demonic symbols after Gabby asked him and Jonah to paint something that matters to them, like a favorite image or missing memory. There's also the weird glitch that occurs when Arpakula asks about Gabby being Jonah's guardian angel. It seems this is a pivotal moment for Francis in which he too begins to break character and becomes more sentient with the Easter episode happening shortly after. We notice that he pauses for Gabby to speak directly to Jonah here when he used to speak over her to continue with the original script. It kind of seems like Jonah isn't the only person who's had their memories wiped by Gabby, and just as the tape triggered Jonah's memories of Gabby, mentioning Jonah in the show seems to have awakened Francis, perhaps both him and his literal inner demon. There's also been some speculation that Leverett, the young rabbit with horns from the West Patch series, is a demon hair as well, but I kind of think this is just a playful nod to angel hair from the Megan sisters. In the third tape, we learn that Jonah has physical scars that his mother attributes to horseplay as a child, but we can't assume that they're from his father. An image of the six recordings Jonah has of the Angel Hair series is present, but there are also additional recordings on the tapes that might be a bit of lore, or at the very least, an interesting coincidence. The titles include Dillinger, The Sword in the Stone, Andy Griffith, Season 5, Episode 23, Batman, A Death Worse Than Fate, and Karate Kid 2, which has been crossed out. And Dillinger, the notorious gangster, is eventually gunned down in an alleyway by an FBI agent after a string of robberies. The Andy Griffith episode celebrates Andy as the sheriff without a gun, and there's a particular quote that caught my interest. He states that he doesn't carry a gun because when a man does so all the time, the respect he thinks he's getting might really be from fear. 
The episode involves another robbery, a bit of deceit, and the antagonist taking advantage of trusting individuals. Even more interesting, guns actually play a big role in stopping the robbery, even though Andy Griffith is praised for not carrying one. In a death worse than fate, there's another robbery, more guns waiting to shoot down Batman and Robin, and a villain who saves the heroes in the end and gets rewarded for it. The sword in the stone symbolizes many things, but in particular, divine intervention comes to mind. Merlin, the wise wizard who plays a major role in young Arthur's journey, acts as a higher force at work in shaping Arthur's destiny, similar to Gabby helping Jonah. There's also the symbolism of growing up, or Arthur's transition from a boy named Wart to the legendary King Arthur. And then there's the Karate Kid too. There's the typical theme of overcoming a stronger enemy, of course, but there's also the death of a father and a raging storm that destroys parts of the village. Guns, theft, divine intervention, death, in a storm. In Jonah's VCR recording, Gabby states that the real sword of the spirit isn't a weapon and references Ephesians in the Bible. She says it's the sharp wit and powerful depth of God's word that is the true armor. She then instructs Jonah to take something off the table. It's heavy, so he must use both hands and hold it by its handle. Gabby wants to see what kind it is and instructs Jonah on how to take it apart into multiple pieces. She then wants Jonah to find somewhere to hide those pieces where nobody can use them for harm. While there's been some speculation as to what the object was that Jonah found, our VHS tapes and the clues from the dialogue itself imply that Jonah found his father's gun, and Gabby was helping him disassemble it to protect himself from further harm. Gabby appeared in the Wild Hair Detective series before. If you look at the pictures near Francine's desk, there's a photo of Zag, Gabby, and a third person whose face is hidden by a glare, but is potentially Michael. In the mixed tape where the gang is playing cards, we can see Angel Gabby crossing over into wild hair, allowing us to see her human form and color. Aside from being a wise angel, she's also a starlet in this world, and with guns being the primary weapon here and her relationship with Zag, she would have had knowledge of the different kinds to aid Jonah. She tells Jonah at one point, I'll always be your warrior. I hope we'll never have to draw a weapon, but as your guardian angel, I'll always be ready. If the additional VHS recordings are a nod to the ongoings of Angel Hair, then perhaps a gun was involved in the death of Jonah's father. But how do storms and theft come into play? In tape four, Francis steals one of Gabby's feathers, and I'm left wondering why he did so. Angel feathers could symbolize hope, comfort, protection, or even purity. Perhaps Francis felt by taking one of Gabby's feathers, he would feel hope and comfort, find protection, or become pure from his demons. She goes on to tell Jonah he can forgive Francis if he wants, but it'll be difficult to ever trust him again, and that Revelations 20 warns us of the place prepared for liars. But if you review Revelations 20, it doesn't specifically mention liars. Instead, it describes a future where an angel comes down from heaven, binds the devil, and locks him away for a thousand years. The devil is then released, deceives the nations, and war ensues. God intervenes, and Satan is thrown into a lake of fire and brimstone forever. Then comes judgment day for the dead and those whose names are not written in the book of life are also sent into the fire. It's Revelations 21, 27 that mentions the dishonest not being allowed to enter the holy city. So I find it curious that Gabby chose a part of scripture that depicts an angel overthrowing evil. She then tells Jonah that something is up to him and asks, what would you like me to do? Jonah appears to hesitate when Gabby says, it's all right, take your time to think about it. It's not an easy decision. Whatever Jonah finally tells Gabby, she replies that she was thinking the same thing. I'll help you however I can. Adult Jonah looks for incident reports in his hometown to learn what he and Gabby may have done, but there was a flood at the municipal building and no record survived. This is oddly reminiscent of the storm referenced in Karate Kid 2 in which the water and wind damaged parts of the village. Commenters noted the correlation between the flood and angel hair and the biblical flood of the earth in the book of Genesis. This flood was caused by God who saw the earth was corrupt and filled with violence, desiring to destroy what he had created and perhaps Gabby felt justified in doing the same to protect Jonah. The thumbnail for this episode reads to find truth and it seems that Gabby is creating her own version of not only the truth for Jonah, but perhaps judgment of his father as God is shown to do in Revelations. But what exactly happened to Jonah's father and was Jonah an accomplice? Given Angel Gabby's protective and caring nature of Jonah, her commitment of always being ready to draw a weapon for him as his guardian angel, the reference to the angel overthrowing Satan, and her desire to hide the gun so that no one comes to harm. 
It seems to me that Gabby took matters into her own hands. Jonah may have needed to be present to turn the television to Gabby's show when his father was home, but then Gabby wanted him away from whatever happened, instructing him to go to her friend's house when something bad occurred. The death or disappearance of Jonah's father is a new trauma of its own, and it may have caused Gabby to alter Jonah's memories. And then she would further erase evidence by flooding the municipal building to further protect him from uncovering the truth and remembering her and what they decided to do. In tape five, Jonah returns to his childhood home where he and Gabby first met. He goes into the attic to search for anything from his childhood that will jog his memories. He learns his mother also tried learning about angel hair and more importantly, his apparent childhood anger in the past. Within a box is a letter to Jonah's mother from Upstate Broadcasting informing her that the angel hair show has not been part of their program block for a while and that any materials remaining in their archive are not for public disclosure as they are currently under the rights of Keith Publishing. Among other things, there's also drawings Jonah made of Angel Gabby and a cease and desist letter from Keith Publishing to his mother. The letter reveals that Eulayla Whitman disturbed employees at their homes, met with Giles Keith under false pretenses, attempted theft of company documents, and harassed the company and strained the business phone lines. In the previous letter, she was referred to as Mrs. Whitman, but the cease and desist letter refers to her as Dr. Whitman. In the West Patch series, there's a cutaway from the cartoon and none other than Jonah's mother appears as Dr. Eulayla Whitman, a child psychologist who is speaking with Giles about the West Patch books becoming a series. Since the cease and desist mentions her meeting Keith under false pretenses, perhaps she feigned being a child psychologist in order to learn more about angel hair. While calling someone Mrs. can be a polite generic way to address an older female, if intentional by the Mangan sisters, it could also signify that Eulayla was married and perhaps is now a widow and that she remembers Jonah's father, while Jonah does not. She may have suspected that Jonah was involved in his death, later finding the gun disassembled and hidden in their bookshelf. Finding Jonah's many drawings of himself with angel wings, flying with Gabby and confronting his father could have also unnerved her and made her aware of his obsession with angel hair since Jonah was apparently alone at home a lot while viewing it. Brenda Mangan, mother to Rachel and Hannah, and the actress who plays Eulayla Whitman has offered a lot of interesting commentary about the show in the community discord, but the sisters have stated this is mostly all in good fun and non-canonical. Still, I commend her for being such a caring and supportive parent. Returning to the Easter video, Gabby explains how to make Easter eggs and she tells Jonah that she paints hers with palm fronds to remind her of promises made. And I'm sure this is the case, but isn't it funny that another symbol of palm fronds relates to victory in battle? Francis presents an egg to Gabby with an Ouroboros and an infinity symbol, representing the eternal cycle of destruction and rebirth. Another egg is a rabbit's face with an X across it and drops of blood or perhaps feathers falling all around. It seems to me to signify Gabby committing a sin or perhaps being called to face her own judgment for what she has done to Jonah's father. In this episode, Gabby tells Jonah that someone was willing to die to keep you from harm. You can always have faith in that. And while the Easter episode is originally talking about the resurrection of Jesus, this could be a double meaning posed by Gabby in which she is also referring to herself. The final egg is a skull with a halo and bones, further suggesting this point and like Jesus, Gabby experienced a symbolic death then resurrection when returning to Jonah, symbolic of the first Ouroboros egg. In case two, after Zack appears, we learn that he can manipulate the cartoon and play the show if Jonah pauses it. Jonah threatens to end the live broadcast and Zack finally responds to him. As Jonah has said before, the live stream seems to be where these characters live, and it also seems that the stream must be happening for the angels to use their powers, as Zack only responds to Jonah when he threatens to end the stream. Zack clearly knows more than he's telling, specifically that he is aware of Wreath and that the show has ended. After the shows ended, Gabby and Zag could have resumed their work outside of the shows and Jonah streaming angel hair could have pulled Gabby back in. Zag being aware of the project previously could have returned to the shows to find Gabby once she went missing from the world itself. He is the angel of wisdom after all, so perhaps he has a certain intuition for things, but if my theory about Michael having a larger role is correct, then Zag and Gabby could have been aware of Michael's intentions and volunteered to be the angels of these two shows willingly. In the final episode, when Gabby tells Zag that they've adapted before and could potentially do the same within the internet, Zag responds that back then, they had help and asks Gabby if she wants a guy on the outside again. It makes me wonder if something happened to Michael, if he's no longer around for some reason. 
In case four, it's hinted that angels can die. Francis comments that they can't, but then Zag gives him a look that suggests otherwise. Whatever happened and whoever Zag is referring to about being on the outside, only he knows the real answer. In case three, Zag can be seen searching Gabby's home and convinces Francis to go off script from the show to help him. Francis retrieves documents for him and we learn that Francis has dreams that may be visions due to being Gabby's longtime friend. Easter morning, the day Gabby disappeared, Francis woke and drew this picture of Gabby. Zag is frustrated because for a kid's show, the illustration is complex and doesn't say much to him. Francis tells him that the image is exactly as he saw it and Zag comments that Gabriel has to be so darn traditional. I'm no expert on religion and a lot of the research I did for this video was brand new to me, but from what I can tell, archangels can appear to humans in a human-like form, but their true forms haven't been described. So it's entirely possible that this is Gabby's true form and she's able to take many forms like an angel hair in the series or the starlet in wild hair to suit who she's trying to help. In case four, Jonah follows Zag's instructions and goes to a church where he somehow has the key to the door. Entering the conference room slash library, he finds a film reel behind a stack of books. Is it mere coincidence that Gabby told Jonah to hide the gun behind a bookshelf as well? And how did he obtain this key? Was it given to him by Zag or was it in his belongings in the attic maybe? At the end of the series, Jonah is seen wearing a wreath of life hat and if the organization was defunct and it's impossible to find information about it online, how did he obtain the hat as well? It's possible that these items are somehow evidence Eulalia collected against Wreath and her research. I also had another far-reaching idea as I usually do, but what if Jonah's father was a member of Wreath? I could see this making his character all the more interesting. A husband secretly working at a company that wants to save children, meanwhile, he's abusing his family. People live double lives all the time and depending on his level of importance within the company, he may not have been aware of the true power of the cartoons that were being created. Wreath could have also issued an NDA so that he was compelled to remain silent or risk losing his job. The audio playing during the first part of this episode is Lights Out, which was a horror radio program that ran in the 1930s. The episode playing is called Devil's Do, and while the dialogue chosen fits the scene well, I couldn't help but realize that this was another reference to death, theft, and the devil. Devil's Due takes place after a robbery murder in which two criminals encounter the devil disguised as a mysterious man. He offers to take them to a place where the police will never find them, discussing their existing partnership by recounting their heinous deeds in the past, saying he was there to see it all. These two killed, maimed, and tortured during their spree and the devil wants his payment for the spoils. Their lives were payment for their misdeeds and forming a pact with the devil. There has to be more to this theme of theft that keeps recurring throughout the series. It can't just be about when Francis stole one of Gabby's feathers or when his mother stole some document. There's a symbolic representation, of course. The father stealing Jonah's innocence and peace, Gabby stealing away Jonah's memories, and then Gabby being stolen from Jonah in a sense as she's pulled away to help other children. But could it also be a hint to something more literal? The merch website for East Patch shares a Keith publishing mug that says, your stories, memories, media, we keep it all. And the product description mentions corporate greed and reminding your library where its best books could go if the wrong contracts are signed. Is Keith stealing all the media it releases through corrupt means and false pretenses? The episodes of West Patch seem to indicate at least something dark and odd is going on with the publishing company through Giles Keith's frequent outbursts, rage, and well, things within West Patch that are better left viewed for yourself. Another thing I found interesting in this episode is that Francine remembers Francis from a time before. She seems to be the female counterpart to Francis in this world and doesn't seem to know anything about angels or wreath, unless, like Francis, she's sticking to the script for now. We know that when both series are broadcasting live at once, they can interact with each other as shown in the mixtape. And when one is airing instead of the other, they can cross over to the current show. So it makes sense that Francis and Francine would know each other. I'm curious to know if these characters will make appearances in other shows published by Giles Keith in the future, perhaps even in Westpatch. In the last Leeds bonus case, we learn that Zag routinely saves women in his show and likes blackjack more than poker because a poker dealer broke Z's heart. He is now banned from the Miriam Casino as a result. In the Bible, Miriam first appeared in the book of Exodus and she is the older sister of Moses. 
teaching, advising, and even attending Moses' death, Zag had a strong relationship with him, and perhaps he fell for Miriam at one point, but was ultimately turned down, with sources showing that Miriam was later married. In case five, Zag and Francis enter a room with many screens. The plan is to stream as many screens as possible in hopes of finding Gabby. But Francis calls these screens demon hair boxes, which made me wonder if he felt that humans were considered demonic. Francis could also be alluding to Keith publishing or Wreath being demonic, which would totally destroy my Michael is behind Wreath theory, but hey, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. It's all in good fun, right? There's also the desktop background when Jonah pulls the screens together to find Gabby. The background image is of the 1994 film Thumbelina, the Hans Christian Andersen version, and the particular scene shows Thumbelina meeting the Prince of Fairies, Cornelius. The prince sings a song titled Let Me Be Your Wings, and the lyrics convey a sense of longing to be Thumbelina's romantic partner and source of support. But don't go shipping Jonah and Gabby just yet. I feel this is more of a nod towards the support scenario, and the image reflects Jonah assuming the role of streaming wild hair and angel hair and keeping Gabby grounded so that the angels can resume their work. He's symbolically becoming her wings as he assists her in performing the duties of guardian angel to other children in need. In the final episode of Angel Hair, after Gabby has been saved and Jonah agrees to help the angels within their live streams, the camera pans out and you see three screens, Gabby's show, Wild Hair, and a screen that's blank. Zag and Gabby look up at the third screen and a new show appears to be loading. I wonder what this show could be. If Michael hasn't died, could this perhaps be a show that he's trapped in? Could it be Westpatch? I'm honestly not sure, but I think this cliffhanger is such an excellent way to end the show because like the loading screen, Eastpatch has done such a wonderful job of leaving a lot of the lore and mysteries open to interpretation of the viewer. At the beginning of this show, I wondered if the series would truly be horror or uplifting, and the answer quite simply is that it's both. The horror is subtle, but it's there, the darkest parts arising from the actions of humans and not the supernatural. Instead, the cursed children show trope is revolutionized and the entity cares for and is helping the child instead of harming them. And if this video wasn't proof enough, lore abounds and it's clear that a lot of attention to detail and love was put into this show. I, for one, can't wait to see more from Eastpatch and I'm dying to get more episodes of the Westpatch series as well. But I want to know what you think. What did you think about the series? Do you think Michael has a hand in all of this? And what about Giles Keith? How far does his deceit go? What lies in Jonah's future? And do you think we'll see the angel hair cast again? Do you want to see me do a video on Westpatch? I know I talked about it a lot, but it is so intertwined into the lore of angel hair. Thank you for watching this video. If you liked it, please make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and definitely follow Eastpatch and the incredible voice actors that made the Angel Hair series possible. Here's another one of my videos about a dark animated series. And as always, thanks for watching.